I wonder what gets you here on the weekend before Thanksgiving. And I wonder what gets me here and the rest of us on the weekend before. And it seems to me that we are being called in some way. And the particular calling that this embodies uh, is a calling to a new level of understanding, I think. We're being called by the gaps between the haves and the have-nots. And we're being called by the incredible uh, possibility and the unfathomable peril that's in front of us these days. Uh, we're called by the knowledge that a fixation on test scores uh, doesn't look like it's growing our humanity, nor seems likely to in the near future. And we're being called uh, by our children, all of our children, I think. And if we're called to this new level of understanding, um, it seems to me that in an information age, we're not called so much by what we know, but particularly by how we know. And that's the turn that we make in contemplative teaching and learning. Uh, this, this turn, this uh, how we know, is really about a more integrated way of knowing. It's integrating inner life and outer. Uh, it's integrating rationality and reverence and integrating uh, compassion and calculation and lots more things we can think to integrate uh, as well. In many ways, this creates, uh, I think, a, a kind of pedagogy of presence, an epistemology of resonance, and a more intimate and subtle empiricism that we uh, can offer ourselves and our students as well. And ultimately, uh, for me, this new level of understanding that we're called to uh, moves us from seeing the world as a collection of objects to the possibility of experiencing the world as a communion of subjects. Thomas Berry's words, by the way. And so for this, uh, for this weekend, maybe we have a chance to deepen and extend our own community and our own uh, sense of calling, and um, uh, particularly this sense of communion, both with this information with one another and uh, with our work. So we're really delighted that you're here. We've been waiting for you. You're the one we've been waiting for, all of you. So, uh, so welcome. Thank you, Tobin. I'm Linda Lantieri, and I know a lot of you, and I'm looking forward to meeting those that I don't know personally. Um, one of the things I think about a lot is making sure I show up at the right time in the right place with the right people. And then allow what can happen with that situation to unfold. And I certainly hope that you begin to feel that you are in the right place at the right time with the right people. And you may have already had a sense of that uh, tonight already. Uh, Tobin and I are part of the leadership council here at Garrison. I'm also the director of a program called the Inner Resilience Program. And I'm connected to an organization called CASEL. And some of you know CASEL as the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. And Tobin and I are going to sort of um, accompany you, hopefully, on a journey that, that we're all part of in these next couple of days. And one of the things I'd like to introduce you to is this idea from Angelus Arian, who is one of my teachers. How many of you know Angie? Anybody have been exposed to her? Uh, I have a lot to uh, thank for her work in the world and to me personally. And one of the things she found, uh, she's a cultural anthropologist and studied many, many cultures of community. Uh, she found that there were certain healing salves that were present in all those cultures that, that were the, the glue that binded things together. 
and she noticed they were present in all, those, all the cultures, and they were these. And we're hoping that you have direct experience with all of these healing salves, as she calls them, as we move through this time together. And she also talks about something called the fourfold way. Again, these internal agreements we can make with each other as we've shown up and are present uh, of how we are going to be with each other and with ourselves. And as you see, the first one, we've done it, but I think we're going to have to keep asking ourselves, are we present throughout this weekend? You know, it's, it's something that we, we commit to over and over again. Uh, to choose to be present. And the second one I think is really important too, you know, the, the pieces of knowing that you might receive may come from those moments in between uh, in your own knowing and your own inner life. Um, so pay attention to what has heart and meaning when you notice a shift in your own uh, feeling level and your emotions um, and notice that. I've learned from some people that uh, they often don't take notes anymore about what the speaker is saying, but about what they're thinking and feeling when they're hearing the speaker. Those are their notes, and it's a little like this. And her third one is to tell the truth without blame or judgment. We want to create an atmosphere here that uh, another wonderful teacher of mine, Parker Palmer, calls that is neither invasive or evasive, that we feel comfortable to be who we are and that we could show up. And to do that, it's important that we tell the truth without blame or judgment. And finally, she says, try to be open um, and, and be not attached but open to uh, outcome. Be open but not attached to outcome. And what that simply means for me is that we have come very well prepared to use our time well, but we're also open to shifting that depending on what happens in this room. And I think that's really part of what this work is about. So I'd like to begin by introducing you to uh, a greeting that comes from a different part of the world, uh, from Natal in South Africa. And the equivalent of hello in English, as you could see here, is sawobona. What it actually means is, I see you. And if you're a member of the tribe, you might reply by saying, Sakona, I am here. Now, what's significant about this is that the order of exchange is really important. Until you see me, I don't exist. It's as if you, when you see me, you bring me into existence. Very powerful. So many of us are holding this vision for this gathering, that it be dedicated to children all over the world growing up with this kind of perspective that one's identity is based on the fact that they are seen, that people around them respect them, that they're acknowledged as unique, and as well that we see each other in these next couple of days and are feeling that we are being seen in all of who we are. So we're going to get a little practice at this in a moment. Uh, you're going to hear some music in a moment. And we're going to go around and uh, sort of greet each other. And you may get a chance to greet two people, three people. You, you keep the pace. And the way it would go would simply be, one of us would say, I see you. I'm here. And then you would connect, and when you feel you've made a connection, you'd move on to someone else. And 
After a while, not very long, so I always tell kids in a classroom when something seems like really weird that you're about to do with them, I, I tell them it's not going to last long. <laughs> and, and you get to tell me, Miss Lantieri, just I don't think you should ever do that again. <laughs> so that's, that's the rule here, OK? Um, we, we might put you through some experiences that may be very different for you, and that you get to tell us, no, I think you should never do that again. So, so this might be one of them for you, but probably will not be. So we're going to begin the music. And, and you don't need anything in your hands right now. And you're going to hear a bell. And when you hear the bell, if you could just stop where you are and be silent, and I'll let you know what you're doing. But right now, you're greeting each other in this way. One of you will begin, and the other will respond, and you'll respond back. So if you could stand up. And you could begin to move around the room. So if you're very easily near someone, just take that as a sign that you're going to do a little sharing with them and stand back to back or sit back to back, whatever feels best for you. And notice if there's anyone that needs a partner. And just simply raise your hand so that we can come to you. Look around and you see the two of you, great. Now again, as I say to the kids, there's one more back there. Could you keep your hand up, please? Did you find someone? One other person here. Do we want to make a threesome? Or do we have? Great, OK. Thank you, if you could do that. Great. So if we can. So in a moment, what we're going to ask you to do is first to say hello to this person that you are going to be talking to and get to know who they are. You may or may not know who they are. Um, and to each take a turn, a full two minutes, to answer these questions. First, how present do you feel right now? And only you know that. And there's not any right or wrong answer, because the second one is really important. What would help you be fully present for these next few days? And sometimes telling one other person in confidence, look, I've got a whole other thing going on here, but I really want to be present here, is actually quite helpful to do. Um, and then finally, what are your intentions for yourself for this time together? And what that simply means is, what's inside of you that you're hoping to be, to do, to receive, to give? What is an intention you're carrying that only you know the answer to? So you'll hear the bell after about two minutes, which simply means the person who's speaking that you're giving full attention to as a listener will end their sentence, and then the other person will speak. And then I will raise my hand for silence. And will give you the next direction. So this is the part where, if you're doing it as a teacher, you sometimes forget to tell them to turn around. <laughs> and I have seen teachers do it, you know, and they think it's like a one-way communication game. No, it isn't. Turn around. <laughs> Thank you. If you could stand back to back again. And you feel free to close your eyes or leave them open, but to just, again, affirm this intention that you just preciously shared with your partner. And also take a moment to remember the intention that was shared by your partner, to you, almost to be a little keeper of 
in confidence. And if you could just turn around and thank your partner, and then let's have a seat. So uh, hopefully you have a few ideas already to put in your little tool chest. But I find that setting intention with children as well. Um, we do it a lot in our work at the beginning of the day, beginning of the week even, and then revisiting it at the end. Uh, sometimes teachers put it on post-its and et cetera. Um, and just this concept of being present, how we move in and out of that and noticing that uh, around yourself as well. So I am privileged to introduce the next person who is a dear friend and colleague. And there was one time many years ago that I gave him a very special, I was asked to speak about him before he received a very special award in the Black Hills. And I said then what I feel about him, and this is Dr. Mark Greenberg, that he is uh, probably one of the people who's first on my list of having integrated the mystic and the scientist in one person. Uh, and his work also reflects that. Uh, he happens to be the Bennett Chair of Prevention at Penn State. Uh, he has helped with a very small group of us many years ago to begin the organization, CASEL. And he serves and has served for the last four years, I think, uh, as chair of the Leadership Council here. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Mark Greenberg, who's going to kind of frame the wider picture of what we're hoping for you to receive and give to each other this weekend. Mark? I, we, we all are on our continuum. I think uh, we're all w interested in new ways of knowing and new ways of being. I'm uh, trying to integrate myself as a person and a scientist. Those aren't the same thing necessarily. What I love about the contemplative approach is that it al allows us to merge the personal and the professional together in ways that are that could be very deep. And um, so some of you may be more on the science side of things, and some of you may be on the, on the practice side. Uh, we can have hubris on either, either side. Scientists think they know a lot more than, than is known. Uh, practitioners often think they often know more than they actually know, too. Uh, and I know this is on both sides of, of my life. So uh, I like the, the Suzuki Roshi quote about being, having a beginner's mind, a Zen mind, a beginner's mind, and that is, I think, what Linda was trying to portray, and that is that uh, we're here to, be, to open ourselves up to, to know what we don't know and to uh, listen to each other and explore what we can learn from each other. So I've been involved in, the, in, in trying to think about these contemplative issues for, for a while, and um, uh, I am I'm concerned that we have limited um, the contemplative world to a world that's mostly what people do sitting on a pillow. And um, I think many of us have shared this concern that there's been a, there was a narrowing of what it meant to, to be mindful or to be contemplative. Uh, and this is from the Center for Contemplative Mind Society. Lar is also going to show the same slide. We're not going to spend time on it, but when you have time, you should spend time on it because it says that there are many, many ways of knowing and, and building this sense of contemplative approach to life. Uh, uh, and um, I, I have a particular couple that I like. I like stargazing, and I like watching fires at a camp, campfire, and I like washing dishes, right? And, and you may have yours. Uh, I also like what I call highway therapy, which is driving down a very long highway for a long time and letting my mind spin away. And those are very different ways of knowing than sitting on a pillow or doing yoga. And they all are valid ways. As scientists, we know a little bit about the world of, of, of different forms of sitting meditation. We know a little bit about different forms of yoga. And we know almost nothing about these other form, many other forms. Most important one probably being prayer, prayer in general. So uh, I welcome you to the idea of being open about how we think about 
what it means to be contemplative, uh, and as we're, most of us are teachers here, how we can think about both individual differences. There are many different ways to be contemplative, and even the Buddha talked about many, many different practices that fit people's temperaments. And in addition, we have the issue of developmental age. So we not only have people that come with different uh, modalities that are more um, uh, likely to be comfortable for them as, as entry points, but we also have different developmental phases of life. And so we, uh, I invite you to be as open as possible in, in thinking that you don't know what the way is. Uh, and uh, I think if we all do that, we'll, we'll learn a great deal this, this weekend.